Howdy, this is the class lecture for um, SPED 314, Thursday, April 9th, on time, money, and measurement. So we're going to start and briefly give you an overview of these three important concepts that are taught in math classes, uh, starting with the idea of teaching time. Now, if you look at the TEKS, and these are uh, snipped from the Lead Forward website, um, it actually starts in first grade where it asks to tell time to the hour and half hour using both analog and digital clocks. Um, from there, as they move up the grade levels, they have to be able to read and write time to the nearest one minute increment. Again, using both analog and digital clocks, and they have to be able to distinguish between AM and PM. And then by third grade, they have to determine the solutions to problems involving addition and subtraction of time intervals in minutes using pictorial models or tools such as a 15 minute event plus a 30 minute event equals 45 minutes. Um, so we're going to talk about teaching time as well as teaching the idea of elapsed time. So beginning with the idea of reading a clock, and this is specifically an analog clock or what you probably consider an old fashioned clock, um, you want to begin with just a one handed clock. So just starting with the hour hand um, and make sure that they understand, you know, to read what the hand is pointing to. Um, once you introduce that two-handed clock where you have a an hour hand and a minute hand, make sure that they understand what is it that's happening to the little hand as the big hand moves around the clock. Um, the best manipulative of this would be what we call a Judy clock. Um, and a Judy clock is the one where the two hands move correctly. Um, so not something that you make out of like a paper plate and hands, but something that will actually, the two arms will move uh, correctly as you're teaching it. Uh, you are going to want to teach them to count by fives around the clock to identify time. So skip counting. Um, you can also put the numbers around the outside of a clock, the 5, 10, 15 around the outside of a clock to give them that visual. Um, they want You want to be very careful because they're going to want to say four when the big hand is at four, right, rather than understanding that that's the actual 20 for 20 minutes after the hour. Um, you're going to have to teach them how to tell time to the five minute increment and actually to the one minute to each little tick mark in between the fives. Uh, you're going to have to discuss time after the hour and time until the next hour. So, you know, 25 minutes after one, which is also 35 minutes before two, that concept, as well as the AM and PM. Um, depending on the child, you have the opportunity to possibly introduce the three-handed clock, which includes seconds, and understand the fact that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. So the relationship between um, the units of measurement in time. So be careful with, these are common misconceptions that children make. Um, when the big hand or the minute hand is pointing at the six, they want to say six instead of 30, like I mentioned earlier. Um, they also make the mistake of whatever number the, the shorter hand or the hour hand is closer to, they want to say that for the hour. And so they have to remember that if it's between 10 and 11, that it needs to hook back or pull back to the 10. Um, and doesn't like, it's not like rounding where it rounds up to the 11. That takes a lot of practice for kids. So this is an example of a Judy clock. I'm sure you've seen these before. Um, just a interesting bit of trivia. It's named, it got its name from um, the creator of the clock. His daughter's name was Judy, and so he named the clock after his daughter. Um, when you're teaching time, the order that you introduce the whole concept of time is first to the hour. So reading 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you know, 6 o'clock, just a whole, uh, whole number hours. Then introducing to the half hour, so 10.30, 1.30, um, you know, just the half hour. You could very likely go to the 15 minute intervals. So in a sense, you're it's like fractions. So you're starting with one whole, then you're going to the half, then you can go to the quarter, um, and then you can work to your five minute intervals and your one minute interval. So ways that you can practice this is you can show a clock and you can have the child tell you the time, um, or you can tell them the time and have them show you on the clock. Okay, either way is good practice um, for children. And uh, in small groups, depending on where they are in this order of introduction, would be what you would have them practicing with you until they can trans transition to a more difficult concept. And obviously, also the idea of elapsed time needs to be taught. Now, when you're teaching elapsed time, um, there's a variety of ways to do this in addition to actually using the Judy clock. Um, but you can also do it on an open number line um, and and have it go from, you know, 12 o'clock to, 
midnight to 12 o'clock noon and they can they can kind of count their time out that way um give them flexibility and give them an idea to ways to figure this out what you do not want to do with lapse time is teach that concept of addition and subtraction so you know if a movie starts at 4 45 in the afternoon and the movie is three hours and 21 minutes long how long you know what time does a movie get out well if all you do is teach them to add and they try to add 45 plus 21 okay they're going to get 66 well that doesn't work because time is ba is a base 60 60 minutes in an hour and so that they don't a lot of kids have trouble especially you know kids that, that struggle in mathematics understanding um how to regroup that 60 minutes into an hour so be careful if you decide that you're going to teach elapsed time by a pure algorithm now you can use um depending on the types of word problems uh, but you can use a schema so think about an elapsed time situation that fits the combined schema. So you've got two different amounts of time and you have to combine them to find a total. A change schema. So again, that would be like the movie theater example or a compare. Somebody did some a, a task for this amount of time. Somebody did a different task for this amount. What's the difference uh, between them? So again, schema could be used for the concept of elapsed time. There's a couple of videos that are posted um, in the shared drive on uh, teaching um, how to teach elapsed time that I would encourage you to watch. All right, let's shift gears to money um, and the idea of personal financial literacy. Now, the overall theme of personal financial literacy was introduced back in, in about 2014, and TEKS were added in starting at kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, my husband is a financial advisor and he thought this was fantastic. The problem was, you know, sixth grade TEKS were introduced with the understanding that kids had all of the TEKS mastered from kinder through fifth. And that's where there was a challenge there. Over the years, children have become much more um, competent in their personal financial literacy skills. But those first few years were rather difficult because there were so many gaps, especially in vocabulary. Um, our focus here is primarily going to be on just the teaching the concept of money, but I do want you to notice these are money teaks from the Lead Forward website. And even starting in kindergarten, you'll see that beyond the idea of just working with money, um, they have to identify ways to earn income, differentiate between money received as income and money received as gifts, list simple skills re required for jobs, and distinguish between wants and needs, and identify income as a source to meet one's wants and needs. So those, beyond just money, those are what are considered personal financial literacy teaks, and you will see those throughout the grade levels, starting in kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. Again, our focus here is going to be just on um, the, teaching the concept of money, but you can see here I just focused on kinder, first, second, and third, um, about what it is that's being taught with regards to money. So starting in kinder, you know, it's identifying the coins by name and sorting them and organizing them into different categories. Then they've got to be able to count by twos, fives, and tens to determine the value of a collection, um, as well as identify the coins uh, by their value and the relationship between them. So it takes five pennies to equal a nickel, two nic nickels to equal a dime, and so forth. Write a number with the cent symbol, so understand how that where that symbol is written and it goes behind a number and what it represents. In second grade, they move up to a collection of coins that go up to a dollar. Um, also use that cent symbol, but in addition to that, the dollar sign and the decimal point, all right, which is getting them prepared for the idea of decimals later on. And then in third grade, kind of combining that and determining the value of a collection of coins and bills. All right, so again, the focus here is just on, on money itself. So when you're teaching money, the sequence would be obviously following the teak. So you'd start with just actual recognition of coins, you know, which one is the penny, which one is the nickel, the dime, um, front and back, the heads and the tail side. You need to make sure the kids recognize. Uh, then relating the coin to the value and the fact that a nickel is actually equal to five cents. Um, counting and comparing sets of coins, creating equivalent coin sets. So, you know, showing them a dime and a nickel and asking them to you know, create a, a similar amount with, you know, a combination of nickels and pennies, anything like that. Uh, select coins for a given amount. So say, you know, show me 47 cents. 
Can you show it to me a different way? Can you show it to me a different way? Making change. Okay, these are real world applications. Um, and then solving contextual word problems. So, you know, giving them word problems that are things that they could actually relate to. So in addition, you know, with coin sums, you can present a pile of coins to them and you can ask them, you know, how much money is that? Or like I said, can you make 76 cents? Can you make it different ways? Um, and teach them that idea of most efficient. In other words, can, what's the least number of coins that you can use to represent the 76 cents? Um, and again, here with um, word problems, just like you can with time, you can use schema um, when, when teaching word problems involving money. Now, um, as far as manipulatives are concerned, you know, what, what would be the best manipulative to use? I mean, you've got, if possible, real coins or the uh, plastic coins that most elementary schools have. Well, hopefully you realize that if you can use the real coins, um, that would be much better. Um, just again, it's, it's just more organic. Um, all right. So when you're talking about actually identifying coins and their value, um, you know, you want to start from the very basic. So a discrete trial training. In other words, give them two coins, just put two coins down and say, okay, give me the penny. Then you can, you know, provide praise. If they're incorrect, you can correct them immediately and do it again. All right. So here, um, you can use not only um, the name of the penny or the name of the coin, but you can also use the value. So you can put down two coins and say, give me five cents. Same thing. If they're correct, pr praise them. If they're wrong, immediately correct them and give them a chance to do it again. Same with sorting. You can have them sort not only by their name, but you can also have them sort by value. Um, another method that's used to teach um the concept of money is the idea of touch coins. Um, now, this is not something I would probably do in a jet ed classroom, but in a sped classroom or in a co-teach, this might be something you would like to consider. Um, in order to be successful with this, though, there is the idea of um, understanding how to count by fives and how to count by tens. The link to this video is in the um, shared folder, and so um, it's not a very long video. I would encourage you to, to watch this and see how this concept of touch coins um, works in case that might be something that you would like to try. All right. And lastly, let's talk um, quickly about the ideas, basics of measurement. Now, when you're looking at the measurement teaks, um, you'll see that they begin in kindergarten um, with, they're, they're pretty general, but it says compare two objects with a common measurable attribute to see which object has more of or less of the attribute and describe the difference. In addition, you have to give an example of a measurable attribute of a given object, including length, capacity, and weight. So those are important vocabulary that are introduced as early as kindergarten. From there, moving into first grade, they begin to use the measuring tools. Um, they illustrate that the length of an object is the number of same size units of length, so that when they're laid end to end with no gaps, you know, they reach from one end to the other. Um, measure the same object with units of two different lengths and describe how and why the measurements differ. Then they go into, into uh, second grade, find the length of objects using concrete models for standard units of length. Um, representing whole numbers as distances, determining the length of an object to the nearest marked unit using rulers, yardsticks, meter sticks, and measuring tape. So the idea of not only um, customary measurement, but metric measurement as well. Um, and then in second grade, they start building on the idea of area by using concrete models of square units to find the area of a rectangle. Um, so again, measurement continues up through the grade levels. Again, we're starting with just the, the basics of measurement, but you know it definitely gets much more complicated when you're um, converting units of measurement in the same system. Um, in sixth grade, they start, they, uh, also convert between systems, so they go between metric and customary. So like I said, this is just the, the basics. So again, when we're talking about the attributes of measurement, we're talking about weight or mass, uh, volume or capacity, length, and area. Okay. Um, keep in mind, in each one of these, there are units of measure in the metric system as well as the customary system, and children need to be uh, familiar with both, and they be, need to be able to connect the measurement to the appropriate system. So they need to know that inches and feet and yards and miles are all customary and that centimeters, 
uh, meters, kilometers, those are all metric, for example. Now, when you're teaching the units of measurement, you want to start with non-standard measures, okay? Um, you want to focus your attention on the attribute that's being measured. Are we measuring length? Are we measuring weight? What are we measuring? And so, for example, you can use pencils, assuming they're all, for example, unsharpened, they're the same length. You can use sheets of paper for area. You can use tennis balls for volume. So when we say non-standard, we mean not using, you know, weights, not using measuring cups, not using rulers. You're using a non-standard measurement. Um, once they have lots of experience with that, obviously you're going to move towards standard measurements. Um, again, uh, focus on the attribute. What is it that's being measured? Is it, you know, length, volume, weight? What is it that they're measuring? Now, something that kids have trouble with sometimes is they get confused in choosing the appropriate metric to measure. So what metric do you use to measure perimeter? You know, that wouldn't be measured in a liquid. It wouldn't be measured in cubes. It wouldn't be measured um, in uh, pieces of paper. So understanding that perimeter is a length measurement, so you would use a tool that measures length. Um, what measure do you use to measure area? So that should be something that comes in squares. Um, volume and capacity would be cubes, okay? Um, and then beyond that, understanding the idea that perimeter um, even though it measures, you know, the distance around a shape, the size of the shape determines the unit, an appropriate unit of measure. So if we're going to measure around a piece of land, we wouldn't do it in millimeters. You know, an appropriate unit would be um, kilometers or miles, okay, yards, depending on how big the land is, uh, versus in our classroom, there we could use feet or yards. We wouldn't use um, miles in our classroom. We wouldn't use kilometers. So again, there's that whole concept of what's the appropriate metric to be to use depending on what it is you're measuring. Um, once they become familiar with that, then it's building on the idea of the relationships between units. So uh, learning that there are 12 inches in a foot, there's three feet in a yard. Now at this point, a lot of times this is around third grade, so they're going to have a star chart. And so on that star chart, the one side is, is all about measurement and it includes rulers, metric and customary rulers on either side. Um, you know, that is a fantastic tool for students, especially students with special needs. Um, but you want to spend a lot of time in teaching them how to use that chart. The smaller units always on the left, the larger units on the right. It's separated into metric and customary. Um, and so, you know, you definitely want to make sure that children have experience learning how to measure with the ruler off of the chart, okay, when when it's inches and when it's centimeters, um, because again, a lot of times there's just confusion between the two measurement systems. Uh, a lot of emphasis on vocabulary, okay, so you need to provide instruction on the actual terminology. The idea that perimeter and the word rim is in the, in the word perimeter is the outside of the shape. It's measured in linear units, whether that is metric or customary. Area, is inside the shape again relating it to real life so carpet on the floor grass in your yard paint on a wall um, versus and it's measured in square units and then volume which is actually filling up something that's 3d okay and that that's measured in cubic units all of those things need to be taught um, as with most concepts that we've talked about, you want to start with a conceptual foundation. So understanding that the fact that perimeter um, is a length measurement, okay? Um, using inches or centimeters, or like I said, a non-standard measurement like straws, um, and understanding that it's a distance that's being measured and that it, it is linear versus area, okay? Um, all of the units are going to be squared units or units squared, okay, because what you're actually measuring is the number of squares that cover whatever that shape is. And volume, like I said earlier, is measured in cubic units or units cubed um, because you're actually filling up a shape. Um, and, and cubes have three dimensions. They have length, width, and height. And so because you're filling up something that's 3D, you have to use units that are 3D as well. So understanding that and giving them a chance to um, practice 
these with, you know, rulers or um, color tiles or snap cubes, something that they can actually physically manipulate. Um, now, obviously, uh, when they're learning to measure units of length, you are teaching the concept of iterating like we did with fractions. Again, with both standard and non-standard, a couple things that you need to emphasize repeatedly is that the units have to be equal in length, okay? Otherwise, you can't iterate by counting. Um, and so, like I said, if you're going to use pencils, they all need to be the same length, so they all need to be unsharpened. So markers might work better. A new box of crayons might work okay, but the units have to be the same length if they're non-standard. Um, so the other thing that you definitely want to emphasize is that when they're using whatever the unit of measure is, um, that they have to be placed touching um, without any gaps and not overlapping either, okay? Because that would uh, constitute a measurement that's not accurate. So again, that's something if you're working with small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, you can catch kids and, and correct that mistake that a lot of them uh, make is they'll leave gaps between the markers or the paper clips or whatever it is, or they'll, they'll overlap them, and you want to make sure that they don't do that. All right, so again, just a quick overview on the concepts of time and money and measurement. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're staying safe and social distancing. Um, and if you have any questions about any of these, I look forward to seeing you on our Zoom meeting. Take care.